I mean, this should be a reason you wouldn't touch this guy. I'm not saying he's guilty of anything yet, but it's out there. And it's, it's until it gets settled, you don't trade for a guy like this uh, strictly for competitive reasons. So, I mean, I think Jalen with the offensive line they have, if it stays healthy with the running backs, he's got um, everything's there for him to be successful. If he's not, he has no one else to blame but himself. Sixty-five. You're on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. Johnny McDonald, Jeff Kerr, hanging with you. Joining us is our buddy Paul Domowitz, who just stepped away from the day-to-day of covering the Philadelphia Eagles, but he was out in Canton this weekend, where his responsibilities as a Hall of Fame voter are still being registered. Uh, Dom, good to get you back here in the area. How was your weekend out in Canton? It was great. I had a good time. How was the Harold Carmichael speech? I mean, from my vantage point, it, you know, he was awesome. Mentioned everything he needed to, but how emotional was he through that whole thing? Yeah, I mean, well, it, you know, he's had a year to kind of have his emotions tempered a little bit, waiting for uh, because of the pandemic. But his speech was great. I mean, the best they, – they, they limited all the speakers this year to eight minutes because of the large number of uh, inductees. And it turned out to be a really good thing not just on his speech, which took about six and a half minutes, but everybody else too, because they just stayed focused. Most of the speeches were written and, and read. Uh, you know, he, his was great. He thanked everybody that needed to be thanked and even spent some time uh, campaigning for uh, Dick Vermeil, who's, uh, you know, up for the Hall of Fame for 2022. That's the best part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I wanted, I want to ask you about two uh, guys. Uh, Dick Vermeil being one of them, but also another uh, former Eagle guy. I uh, talked to one of uh, your compatriots last night who's uh, a, a Hall of Fame voter who uh, mm -hmm. specifically said a Philadelphia Eagle that he thinks has been shortchanged and has to get into the Veterans Committee. But first, first things first on Dick Vermeil. Um, does it, you'll help to make the case. What do you think the uh, respect is for Dick Vermeil in that room with your fellow voters? We saw our two coaches get in last night or uh, the night before with Cowart and Jimmy Johnson. Is Dick Vermeil in your eyes a uh, legit candidate? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, the, the way the process works with, you know, they have a coaching category and they have a seniors category, which is how Harold got in after, you know, after you've not gotten as a modern era candidate as a player, you go into a senior pool with the coaches there's there's five people on a coaches committee uh, from our 48 man committee who are going to select one guy out of uh, five. I think there were nine finalists to start. Uh, Dick was one of those. Uh, I, I'm, I'm unless I just totally uh, get blindsided here. It's down to him and Mike Holmgren uh, this year. You know, it's uh, I don't know how those five feel. Uh, I know a couple of them are going to vote for Dick, um, but uh, you know, it just. You know, Dick's 84, uh, Mike's 72. They're both going to get in uh, at some point here in the next two two years, three years. I just think uh, it's Dick's time. You know, he's, he, he's really suffered from the, the the Eagles situation. He took over just a horrendous team, as you know. Uh, I mean, in 76, that team had not only was bad, but it had no draft picks uh, higher than the fourth round for like three years. Uh, and yet he, he got them to the playoffs and got them to the Super Bowl. You know, that Super Bowl win by the Raiders over, over Dick's team ended up kind of changing the course of history for both him and uh, uh, Tom Flores. I mean, Tom Flores went in uh, as part of this year's class. Uh, and, you know, and Dick's still waiting. If Dick had won that, if, you know, if the Eagles had won that game, Dick would have been in 10 years ago. Well, my thing is with Vermeil, and this is where I would pound the table for him, how can you have pretty much every member of the greatest show on turf in but not the coach of the greatest show on turf. It, yeah. It's like it's going to be him and Tory hold. Eventually they're both going to get in. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like I said, it's just a matter of time. Uh, I just hope that for his sake, the time is now the, uh, the meeting there, the meeting of the five uh, people that will decide that is on August 24th. 
I had uh, Clark Judge on my show uh, last night on CBS Sports Radio. I know you know Clark uh, well, Donald. And right. I asked him about the upcoming class and uh, what's going to happen in the next couple of years. We certainly reviewed all of the guys who got in uh, both the Centennial class and then last night's class. And the guy he immediately went to said, guy I think should be in who's been overlooked by the Veterans Committee is Al Wister, the former Eagles offensive lineman who played many years ago. And you have to know your history and do your research to know how good a player he was. And he made a really compelling case on my show last night. Now, this is not a Philadelphia show. This is a national show. And he made a very compelling case for Al Wister should be in. And he's disappointed in the uh, group uh, that put the veteran guys in. Um, have you heard that? Has that come up? Now, you were there when Al was being considered by the Veterans Committee, or maybe you weren't. Uh, I should ask that as a question, not as an assumption. Um, for what you know about the possibility of that former offensive line grader, the Philadelphia Eagles, do you think he can get the nod on the uh, Veterans Committee? Last year, Jody, when they had the centennial class, which Harold is part of, uh, that exp was an expanded 10 seniors uh, as opposed to the usual uh, two, one or two. Uh, they, they initially had 20 finalists uh, and, and settled on 10. Um, Al was one of those 20. So, I mean, he's in the, he apparently is, 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 you know, I don't know where he finished uh, when they decided to uh, pare down to 10 because I wasn't part of that committee. That was actually last year was a separate committee. It included people like uh, Bill Belichick, uh, Ron Wolf. It was mostly football people. There were still a few, uh, 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 writers that were a member of that committee that voted on the centennial class uh, seniors. But uh, so, I mean, the fact that he was one of the 20 finalists would seem to indicate he's on the radar. Uh, you know, I was told several years ago when I, I was trying to stir up some sentiment for him that they had kind of moved past the pre-1960 uh, uh, guys uh, and were, you know, and yet they've since then they've added a lot of seniors from before that. So you know, I'm hoping at some point Al gets in. I don't think it's imminent. Uh, but the fact that he was one of the 20 finalists last year tells me that he's at least on their radar. Now, when Carmichael got in, I basically was John some notes down. I'm like, I can't think of outside of Al Wister. I really can't think of any Eagles players that will get in anytime soon. Has there been any conversation with anybody in the Eagles history? Well, I mean, the, the two guys that I think, you know, if you're looking at after Dick that deserve to be in, one is Eric Allen. Yep. Uh, I've, been yep. lobbying for, I've been lobbying for him for five years with, with the rest of my colleagues on the committee. Finally got him into the final uh, 25 this last year. So I think that's a step in the right direction. Uh, I'm hoping he's a, a consideration of the finalist this year uh, because he belongs, you know, he belongs to at least be discussed in the room with the, with the final 15. The other guy is uh, Seth Joyner, uh, you know, who doesn't get enough credit for for his career. And I mean, he's he's another guy that that at some point I think it, it may end up being as a senior because I mean, there's the you others. Know, I can't remember if it's twenty or twenty five years after your career's over that you are eligible as a modern era candidate before you go into the senior pool. But you know, I know he wants to get in soon. Um, you know, I'm still waiting. The, the guy, I've been, the linebacker I've been pushing the, the hardest the last few years has been Sam Mills. Uh, right after Sam, in my mind, as far as deserving is set. Damo, I want to get your take on this uh, because I respect your, your your overall football knowledge and your grasp of not only the game but the NFL as an entity. Uh, reading Peter King's Football Morning in America column, uh, he made a a, a leap of uh, faith that I had not thought about last night as I was watching the Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And as soon as I read, I go, damn, that's a good point. Um, Peyton Manning was great, as we expected him to be, because Peyton gets it. He's got a lot of personality. He's uh, very good on commercials and hosting Saturday Night Live. So you knew he was going to put out a bit of a show, which he did. And he only had 10 minutes to do it. And he stayed within the 10 minutes, too, which was not easy to do. So give him a lot of credit. He put a huge emphasis on the game of football. When you go up there, you thank your teammates, you talk about your family, what motivated your peewee coach and whatever. Peyton got through that pretty quickly. And he talked at length 
about the game of football and what it means and how you have to honor it and you have to be dedicated to it. And we have this great game and we need to protect it and uh, cherish it and whatever else. And Peter King drew the conclusion that, you know, Peyton Manning make a hell of a commissioner one of these days. If he wants to do that, uh, at some point, Roger Goodell is going to step down. He's had a nice tenure so far. He'll do it for a bit longer. But at some point, he'll be replaced. What do you think of Peter's idea? Peyton Manning as net commissioner of the National Football League. I think it's an excellent idea. I don't think uh, Peyton would have any interest in it because of the time. Uh, 30 some odd million a year. You know how much money they pay that guy to do that job? That's a whole bunch. That's more than Peyton got paid to throw the football. First of all, you have to move to New York, and I can't imagine Peyton wanting to do that. You got a point there. Uh, yeah. but just from the standpoint of, of, of the person for the, for the job, I think it would be excellent because, I mean, nobody has a greater respect for the game than than Peyton I and mean, his entire family, for that matter. I mean, Arch, going down to Archie, uh, I mean, it'd be a great thing. But, again, I don't, I don't ever see Peyton being interested. I want to bring back the Eric Allen, Seth Joyner conversation here. I think Seth is still the only player in NFL history. I think with like what fifty sacks and like twenty five interceptions or or something like that. Like, why do you think he's been omitted, even though he was a great linebacker with the Eagles and he does have a couple of Super Bowls? Yeah, I mean that was one of the best defenses in in, in, in NFL history um, because they did not win any playoff games. Um, you know, I think it's gotten slighted. Um, you know, inside linebackers are a hard sell because there aren't as many stats to point to. I mean, you just have to watch Seth play to appreciate what he meant to a defense. Um, you know, again, I, I hope someday he gets in. Um, you know, right now you've got two guys that were finalists the last two years, Zach Thomas and Sam Mills. They'll probably be finalists again this year. They'll probably not get in. Uh, maybe one gets in. It's just a very – at some positions, it's just such a painfully slow process because, you know, people – a lot of people on the committee don't seem to have as much respect for certain positions as others. Damo, no, you're not doing it uh, day in and day out the way you used to, but I know you've got a keen eye still on the Eagles – um, we saw Jalen Hurts for four games last year and drew some conclusions on him. New coaching staff, new way of doing things. He is literally number one at the top of the Eagles uh, chart as of right now. Uh, projecting and off what you've heard or seen about practice this year. He's going to be their guy. It doesn't look like this to Sean Watson trade thing going to happen. So he's going to get a year to show that he should and or could be the Eagles quarterback going forward. Um, where do you think Jalen Hurts is that in his development? Is he going to be able to capture the job this year and hold it for the Eagles? Yeah, I mean, I, I've liked Jalen since they drafted him. I, I mean, I was one of the few people that thought it was a good move, not because I thought he was ultimately going to be replacing Carson, but it just made sense to, to when you had an oft injured quarterback as your starting quarterback to find a, a guy that, that would be a good backup and you could develop into a starter. I think he can be a starter in this league. I don't know that for sure. He's had an inconsistent camp so far, but the entire offense has. And I don't think you can tell much by these practices because most of them are non-contact. Or uh, I mean, until we get into some of the preseason games, we'll have a better idea how this offense is going to work. And even then, it's going to be a very vanilla offense. Um, you know, they're not going to run him much in the preseason, which is going to be a big part of his game regardless. Uh, you know, he's – He's got to keep mistakes to a minimum and, and make smart decisions. I hope – I mean, the biggest mistake this organization can make would be to, to trade for Deshaun Watson. I mean, and I, I think it's it's on their radar. I mean, they're interested in him if, if the price was, was not just terribly prohibitive because, I mean, they're not worried about the women that he's accused of sexually harassing, which, which kind of concerns me from the standpoint of the organization. I mean, you know, that should be a concern. I mean, this should be a reason you wouldn't touch this guy. I'm not saying he's guilty of anything yet, but it's out there. And it's it's until it gets settled, you don't trade for a guy like this uh, strictly for competitive reasons. So, I mean, I think Jalen, with the offensive line they have, if it stays healthy, with the running backs he's got, um, everything's there for him to be successful. If he's not, he has no one else to blame but himself. Now, you've seen – 
tons of coaches over the years. Rhodes, Reed, <laughs> Chip. Uh, you know, how does Nick Sirianni compare in his first uh, year or training camp with the Eagles compared to a bunch of those other coaches? Well, I mean, whether he can coach or not, we're going to find out, Jeff. Uh, I like Nick from a personal standpoint. He's a great guy to deal with so far. Uh, very friendly, very honest. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I like him from that standpoint. His offense, you know, we don't really have a grasp of what it's going to involve. Uh, we won't know that till the season starts. You know, is he in an over his head? He's got a young staff that I think is going to get better as the, you know, as they're going to be better next year than they are this year because they're so young, including him. Uh, so I don't know how this is, you know, I, I can't make a judgment on his, on his coaching ability at this point. Uh, all I know right now is he's, he's a nice guy. Damo, you've uh, also covered Howard Roseman his entire time here in Philadelphia. Up the ladder, back down the ladder, back up the ladder again, and the entire Howie Roseman era. Uh, one of the staples of Howie has been trying to identify a talent, get him done before he becomes a free agent, keep him here in Philadelphia, lock him up to at least a fair contract. They have not done that yet this year. They have not done a uh, deal with a guy – either with years to go on his contract on his rookie deal and or one more year to go on a veteran deal. They haven't really ex chosen anybody to extend and get the deal over and done with and not dealt with free agent. We know who the guys who are in there last year of their Eagle contract. Uh, I'm sure that he's at least contemplating it and or debating it. They just restructured a couple of contracts uh, last week to give themselves some flexibility under the cap. Is this going to be a non-Eagle move to buy out somebody going forward? Is it, If it's going to happen, who would you say is the most logical candidate at this time? Well, I mean, if, if, if let's say they, they decide they do want Watson and they make a trade for him. Obviously, then they've got to do something because they're going to have to make cap room. I mean, the obvious guy is Fletcher Cox. I mean, he's got a $24 million cap. Uh, hit and and they haven't touched they haven't uh, you know they've restructured his deals in the past they didn't go to him this year uh, so that would be where you would start if you were looking to, to create room I you know the cap is going to jump next year guys uh, significantly and it's going to keep going up I mean, this they're, this 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 league is about to make obscene amounts of money they've already made are making obscene amounts but with all the new, uh, revenue streams out there uh, for broadcasting, for putting their product out there. They're just going to be making – the cap is just going to go sk skyrocketing. So you don't need to be a very smart cap manager anymore. Uh, you know, you just need to be a, evaluate talent uh, fairly decently. So I, I don't expect – unless they trade for somebody like Watson, I don't expect them to make many deals because you look at the guys they've got. They've either got older guys that are probably on their last year with the team or going to be maybe gone by 2022 after 2022, or they've got guys that are still in their second or third year on their contract, like a Miles Sanders, guys like that, who, who they can't renegotiate yet. What have your thoughts been on Jalen Rager? I always, you know, I thought the Monte, I think it was February or March or so, and mm -hmm. Jalen still seems confident, like even with his struggles. I, what have your thoughts been seeing him in practice? Yeah, you know, well, seeing him in practice has been kind of hard because he, he missed some time with uh, <laughs> personal issue of losing a friend and um, you know missing uh, not uh, failing the conditioning test at the beginning, you know, which is not a good thing when you've had coming off the season he's had. You would think your mind is focused on one thing. Um, he's got talent, you know. They, they made a huge mistake there. J Justin Jefferson was the guy they should have drafted. Everybody knows that. Uh, but Jalen Rager can play, and there are ways, there are unique ways to use him. Uh, they're going to, you know, screens, uh, get, him, get him the ball in space. And they have a lot of guys like that this year. Uh, even their fifth round pick, who I really love, the kid, the running back from Memphis, um, it, uh, whose name escapes me at the moment. Kenny Gainwell. Kenny Gainwell. <laughs> I mean, just get him the ball. You're going to see this, this offense run a lot of screens, a lot of quick passes. Um, you know, I don't. Everybody thinks of Jalen as a guy that they're going to throw the ball deep to, like they did Deshaun, and they will. I mean, he's got he's got more speed than he showed coming out of TCU. But I mean, I, you just want to get him the ball, and I think he can be successful in that role. You know, he's going to probably be returning punts for them, assuming his, his hands are dependable. Um, so you know, I, 
He's not Justin Jefferson, but I think he can be a productive pick for them. Damo, sticking with wide receivers, that would be Devonta Smith, the number one draft pick this year, who unfortunately got hurt week to week. We see him out there. He's catching balls on the jugs gun. So we think he's going to be back at practice pretty soon, but he's missed some significant snaps here. How big a deterrent is that? How much is he pushed back? Uh, do we cut him some slack at the beginning of the season because he didn't get a full training camp in? Uh, those are the breaks. You get hurt, you get hurt. Yeah. But how much do you think it's going to affect his first month in the NFL? I don't think that much, Jody. I mean, this kid's a quick learner. Um, we've got chemistry with uh, Jalen already. So, you know, since they had played at Alabama, they, they worked together during the spring, both here and down in Houston. Um, so I think that's going to be a problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's all about getting to the starting line in this league now. Uh, you know, so you're going to basically have guys like that sit out as long as it takes for an injury like his uh, to get 100% so that he's ready on week one. So, you know, uh, it doesn't concern me much. I, I think he's going to have an instant impact. Uh, the Andre Dillard, Jordan Mulata thing, it looks like Mulata is running away with it. But see, yeah. Andre Dillard has, yeah, has to be the backup. Do they try to trade him or do they just kind of keep him around as, in case Mulata goes down? Well, I mean, their their offensive line is looking like ten deep right now. I mean, you got to love it, uh, regardless. But I mean, Malad, I think you're right, Jeff. Malad is going to win that competition. It's pretty. I mean, unless something happens here in the you know in the preseason, if Jordan gets hurt. But if everybody stays healthy, it's Jordan's job. Now, what do you do with with Dillard? I don't think you go and shop him. Uh, I think you go into it looking at okay, he's going to be our swing tackle, our backup swing tackle. But you kind of hope that you have a situation at left tackle like you had in the year they tra- uh, Sam Bradford got traded to the uh, uh, Vikings, where you you hope somebody loses their left tackle in week uh, the, the week before the season, and it's just so desperate, and and still has their grades on Andre Dillard from the draft, and they're willing to make a deal and maybe give you a second or third round pick for him. Well, that was the way that uh, we all looked at Zach Ertz during this offseason. Well, somebody's going to have to lose their tight end if Howie's going to get as high a pick as he wants for Zach Ertz, and that may or may not happen. But last night, Zach Ertz got a rousing standing ovation down at Lincoln Financial Field when he came out for the Eagles live practice. He's been a professional about it. He's come back. He's worked hard in practice. All right, maybe turns his shorts inside out so you can't see the Eagle logo. So we know it's not a 100% healed relationship between he and the organization, but getting the kind of ovation that he got from the fans last night, uh, how much do you think that helps Zach Gertz prepare mentally for this season if he's going to stay as an Eagle, even though at least in his mind, it looked like he had already checked out? Yeah. I mean, Zach's a smart guy. He knows that that for him right now, the only option – is to have a terrific season, and it just only enhances his chances of getting a, a deal next next year when he becomes a free agent. Um, you know, I mean, he's 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 not going to get a, a long term contract, but I mean, if he's he shows this year that he can catch seventy balls, there are going to be a lot of teams that are going to want him next year. Uh, so, and and you know, he's playing in this offense with Jalen. Uh, he's going to catch a lot of balls this year if, if if he ends up staying on the roster the entire season because. I mean, you know, if you're if you're Hurts, I mean, he used his tight end at Oklahoma uh, very productively. Uh, you know, he's got Goddard. He's got. I mean, he, there are just so many weapons there that it, it only made sense for for Hertz to just kind of come to the acceptance that you're, you know you're probably going to be here for the year, make the most of it, and move on. I think you were at the practice where Lane Johnson spoke, and he talked about Jason Peters and you know kind of how much. He missed his presence there. Is Lane Johnson starting to become that new Jason Pierce of the offensive line, or is Kelsey kind of taking those reins? I don't think anybody's quite like Jason Jeff. Uh, you know, I mean, just he was just such a unique guy. Um, I think both of them in their own way. I mean, that's probably the you know one of the great things about this offensive line, besides the talent, is you've got three thirty-three year old guys who, while you know being thirty-three means they're uh, more prone to injury give you just a lot of knowledge. I mean, with Brooks, with Kelsey, with Johnson, just helps everybody else. Uh, you know, Sam Mollo's experienced, but I mean, they're all helping uh, 
a lot of they're all going to be able to help Hertz. Um, so, you know, I, I, Lane is, Lane is not the, I don't think he's the teacher Peters was. I mean, Peters was one of those guys. I mean, he'd take guys off to the side, a young kid that nobody was even thinking about as the guy that was going to play and, and kind of give him some tips. You know, Lane be happy to do that. I just don't see him reaching out to people unless he thinks they want him to reach out. Uh, that's, and, and Jason's kind of the same way. You know, you ask me something and I'll help you. But Jason was more of a, a, a and which is kind of odd because you think of Jason as an introvert who, uh, you know, he never talked to us or very seldom did. He, I mean, so he had no use for the media, but uh, he loved to, to deal with young players. I mean, I think ultimately he's going to be a coach in this league. Uh, and I think he's going to be a great one. I, I thought maybe he'd come back this year as, you know, help out uh, uh, Stoutland a little bit. Uh, maybe that'll happen at some point, but I guess maybe he just wants to to lay back and enjoy things down in Texas. Damo, I'm going to readily admit I'm putting on my eagle colored glasses for this last question for me. Um, we found out, although I don't think Nick Sirianni wanted anyone to find out, but we did, that he actually has a competition every single practice. Well, we know he's about competition, but the offense against the defense. And at the end of the day, he adds up who he thinks want to play offense or defense, and he has a winner. It's either offense or defense every single day. Defense has been killing the offense. If you look yeah. at the total scoreboard, it hasn't been close. It's the defense in a runaway. I'll go off it. I'll go glass half full here. It's because the defense has been that good. Not that the offense is still learning and or struggling. Um, if that's the case, and this defense is going to be better than maybe we projected when we looked at the roster before they ever showed up for a training camp practice, what's going to be the key? Who are the guys or uh, the scheme or what? what is going to be the thing that we look in week in, week out and go, yeah, this Eagle defense has got a chance to win the game because of this. What do you see out of the defense early? Can it last all year? I think with Gannon's defense, it comes down to the same thing that uh, uh, that Schwartz's did, the, the front four. Um, and the front four for me, I mean, they were the front four was good last year, but I mean, Fletcher Cox is the key there. I mean, he can be a dominant force. He hasn't been that since 2018 when he was the second best defensive tackle in the league. The last two years, you know, he started one year with injuries, so it took a while to get, you know, to get back to 100. percent he needs to make that leap where he can have or, or double or double teams are, are nothing to him uh, because you can't count on the other guys to uh, get one, you know, win one on ones. But I think that said, I mean, you look at their, the talent, they you know, Josh Sweat seems to be making that leap into a, a you know, a starter, uh, regardless of what happens here with Derek Barnett. You know, they, they added Ryan Kerrigan, who still has something left. I mean, you just don't want to overuse him, but I think in a limited role, He's going to be, you know, he's going to be a dangerous pass rusher for him. So I think everything starts with that, with that defensive line. They've upgraded their linebackers, which is good. Uh, and, you know, the kid that's been impressive in camp so far, you know, they traded, they, they got, they signed Steve, Steve Nelson, the kid from the Steelers. Um, but the rookie, uh, Zach McPherson, has had an excellent camp. And I don't think it's a fluke. I mean, I think this kid's legit. And I mean, I would, it would not surprise me if, Week one against Atlanta, he's he, uh, Atlanta, Detroit, I'm Atlanta, Atlanta. Atlanta. Um, that he's the starting cornerback opposite Slay rather than Nelson. Wow. Last, last one for me, Paul. Uh, of the 2017 Eagles uh, Super Bowl team, I, I think Jay Spears is going to the Hall of Fame. But is there anybody else that has a shot? Uh, I mean, Jason Kelsey is going to get some consideration. Uh, you know, he's under. I think he's under estimated because of his size, but there, you know, there, there hasn't been a guy, a center as athletic as him in the league in, in maybe 20 years that I can think of. I mean, so he's going to, you know, he's a guy that certainly down the road will get consideration after that. Boy, I don't know. Uh, I don't see anybody else that, you know, that jumps out at me right now. And if he does, Jason Kelsey makes it. And I'm with you, Domo. I think he absolutely deserves and will get consideration. I wonder if he's going to be like Alan Fanica. How many pounds did he drop last night when he got he's down to about, what, 210? Wasn't he a 330-pounder during his playing days? Man, some of these guys get in much better shape after they stop playing. Even when they're still playing. I mean, I, I don't know if you, uh, 
few, it was the last week when Brandon, we were talking to Brandon Brooks. And uh, he said when he had the boot on after he tore his Achilles, he went down from 335 to 285. So the natural question, and now he's back up to 330. My natural question was, I asked him, okay, how did you put the weight back on? And he, he admitted that he spent a lot of time at Taco Bell. Uh, among other <laughs> not too much. But yeah, I mean, some, it's, it's impressive. Uh, Jeff, I mean, you look at Steve Hutchinson the same way. Uh, so a lot of these guys, I mean, A, they're not lifting as much, so their body changes. But, you know, a lot of them, take care of themselves for a, you know, a long time afterwards and stay, but they get lighter and they, and they still look good. Unfortunately, a lot of those guys, well, I mean, that, that was one of the sad things about the hall of fame. They bring out all the old, you know, there were a hundred hall of famers from the past that came out. And some of them, you just look at and feel so sorry for them, what the game did to them, what the after the post life, uh, post career life did to them uh, is just unfortunate sometimes. And I don't think we'll ever know about Jason Kelsey because when he gets inducted into the Hall of Fame, he's probably going to break out that mummer suit again. Just well, a guess on my part. We <laughs> shall see. Uh, Dama, always a pleasure, buddy. You know we're going to tap into you plenty during the year. Thanks for hopping on with us today. We'll get you back up in a month or so. Thanks, bud. Thanks for having me, guys. Take care. Paul Domowitz, uh, formerly. 